Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Jacob Edwards Library here in Southbridge. I'm delighted to think that we have an in-person audience as well as an audience at home. That's really wonderful. And we are so thrilled to have Janice Harvey here this afternoon, all the way from Worcester. All the way from Worcester. It's really nice because um, I know personally that I've uh, read your column in yeah. the Worcester magazine for years and always enjoyed it and really appreciated the slant that you have and your perspective. So um, Janice is also an educator and recently retired. So um, she really has uh, had a long career in education and in writing in this area. She's going to present today from her book, which is called Searching for Atticus. And uh, the book is going to be available for sale and for signing if anybody would like to uh, after the presentation. So I'm hoping that you will take advantage of that. Um, so, uh, we are delighted that Janice would come this afternoon to Southbridge and um, we look forward to you reading some of your book and maybe telling us a little bit about your biography and you know what got you to this point. And if people have questions, we'd be happy to take questions afterwards and especially if people are interested in the writing process. That's usually one of the, the chief questions. So thank you very much, Janice. Welcome to Southbridge. Thank, thank you for having me here today. I appreciate it um, as a writer. You don't always get to share your stuff with the people. You, I hear plenty from people when I write the column for Worcester Magazine. I actually hold the record for hate mail, actually. Um, 173 pieces because I made fun of tattoos. I recommend that you never do that, by the way. I found out that people who really love their tattoos have very little sense of humor about them, so I don't recommend that you do that. Um, but I've heard a lot of nice things too. But this is lovely because, um, have any of you read the book yet? You have, sir, thank you, oh, lovely. Um, I hope that you will want to read it after we're done speaking, after I'm done speaking. It's a, uh, it's what, I guess what they call a coming of age. It is set in Worcester, Massachusetts. It starts in 1963 on a date that many of us are familiar with, November 22nd, 1963. And the protagonist is a girl named Molly, and she's kind of a spitfire in some ways. Um, kind of a kid whose family life has led for her to be an independent kid trying to make it on her own, figure out things, because there's not a whole lot of support around her. Um, I did want to let you know first, though, I have a dedication in here. Uh, well, first off, would you like to hear about Worcester Magazine a little bit? It's such an exciting thing. <laughs> Actually, no, I'll give you the history of me. The history of me is in, back in 1993, Worcester Magazine was purchased by Alan Fletcher. Alan Fletcher had grand ideas for the paper and turned it into a wonderful thing. Um, he, at the time, managed to talk two editors from the Telegram and Gazette over to Worcester Magazine, Paul Della Valley and Walter Crockett. And they very much encouraged new writers. I was a newly single mom of two. And uh, I had always been like closet writing. I have a brother who is a writer, a playwright, and an English professor. And <clears throat> I said, uh, maybe I'll give it a try. So I wrote something and I, put it in the mailbox, and as long as I live, I won't forget it, because I put it in the mailbox. My son was standing next to me, and I tried to go back, put my hand back in to pull it out, because I said, ah, this stinks, I can't, you know, and I, I was really like hanging into the mailbox. <laughs> Never got it, and instead they, they ran it as what they called the first person. They, they had, um, and they've actually, I think they revived it, but at the time, first person was for any fledgling writers in the area. So I was the first first person and I got a check for $35 and I almost fell over. I was so excited. I am a writer, I decided. So that was the beginnings. Um, and all the while I was putting myself through school uh, at Clark University. I, I worked as a um, teaching assistant in Worcester with special needs kids. And I was going to school and trying to raise the kids. And I did finally chip away at that enough so that I became an English teacher in, in, uh, in North High, actually. I was at North High in Worcester. It was a pretty tough school. And then I went over to the Gerald Crema Center, which was even a little bit tougher because those were the kids that had fallen through the cracks at North. And I finished my career there, but it was wonderful and I loved it. And I loved the kids. The tougher they were, the more I liked them and harder, more trouble they gave me. I kind of liked them even more. But um, anyway, so that is the story of my writing. But 
Before I go any further with this, I have a dedication page in here that really means a lot to me. It's dedicated to two people. One is to the memory of my brother Kevin, who was my first teacher. We lost him um, in 2020 to cancer. He was only 72. He was truly my inspiration for everything. He was 10 years my senior. He just handed me books as he read them from when I was this big. And he never really took into account whether or not I was the age for it, or if it was appropriate. He'd just go, here, read this. And I'd go, okay. So consequently, by about the seventh grade, I had gone through Tennessee Williams, and I had read all these things that were probably would have given my English teacher an absolute heart attack if she knew what I was reading. And matter of fact, it did a couple of times. But um, he really was like my first teacher as I said. So this was definitely dedicated to him. And the other dedication is to a woman named Cheryl O'Brien. And I said, to Cheryl O'Brien, who taught me to trust my words. Cheryl O'Brien was an amazing woman who, um, she wrote mystery novel, novellas actually. And Cheryl was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And we had grown up in the Columbus Park area but had drifted away and you know, had, I hadn't seen her for a very long time. But she started writing an amazing blog throughout her journey through cancer. It was just phenomenal. She would get, I don't even know how she did it, but she did it. And we started to correspond early in the morning through text because I'm an early morning writer and so is she. Excuse me. And um, she uh, asked me if I had anything we tried to keep it so that I didn't want to ask her about her health at all. I knew enough about it. I thought, give her a respite from this, you know, talk about writing. So that's what we did. We would talk about different things, send each other different things. And she said to me, have you got anything big there? You've been working on a novel? I know you have been, you know. And I was like, well, yeah, I have this book, you know. And I had started this quite a while ago, but I had completed it during the pandemic. When else, what else were you going to do? So I just decided to complete it, and I had kind of shelved it. And she bugged me and said, send it to me, send it to me, send it to me. And I kept thinking, this woman, I do not want her spending the last weeks of her life plowing through my stuff. But she was incredible. And she went through the whole thing and sent it back with notes and this and that and encouragement and then said, okay, and now I'm sending you the name of my publisher and I want you to promise me that you are going to get this published now. This was a promise. You know, there are some promises that you make and you, you gotta stick by them. And I said, okay, I will. And uh, she passed away in September and the book came out in December. So I, I followed, I followed what the boss said and, um, it's really been, I, I really have to credit her with this because I might have just been lazy and not got the thing up and going. And it does mean a lot to have it, you know, out there. The cover was designed by my nephew, Ellery Harvey, who uh, he's a graphic designer. And I contacted him and said, I want you to do the cover for me. This should be a family affair. Um, but I want you to bring some Worcester into it. We went back and forth on this. He did a great job with it. If you look at it up closely, it's a whole map of Worcester behind the books. Um, so he did a wonderful job. The hardest part was finding a picture that I could tolerate of myself, which is very small. And I said, black and white, please, please. So that worked out well. But anyway, I will read for you. Um, first, I have a little quotation here that I have this on the wall over my desk in my home. Um, it's from Hopper Lee. She wrote these words in, actually, they're in um, To Kill a Mockingbird, which that's the Atticus is a reference to that character. She was powerful, not because she wasn't scared, but because she went on so strongly despite the fear. And that pretty much sums up this character, I think. So I will start this for you. Just going to read the first chapter for you, and I hope that it makes you want to read more. History in the making. Until those shots were fired, it had been a regular old Friday at Hammond Street Elementary. When it was time for dismissal, I couldn't find my hat. The coat room outside Miss McDonald's class was swarming with kids, everybody shoving, fidgety with the anticipation. And when I found it, I pulled the hand knitted cap over my head without tying it under my chin. I let the strings dangle, tickling my neck as I slipped my arms into the coat that used to be my cousin's. Miss McDonald wasn't liking this noise, children, and she said, so, she said so only once. Everybody settled down, knowing that we wouldn't be allowed to form our patrol line if we were making any noise. We were quiet as church mice then, because her arms were folded, and we all knew what that meant. 
When we finally got outside, the air hit my legs real hard. We girls still had to wear dresses all the time back then, with the exception of snow pants under our skirts on snow days. You guys remember that? <laughs> and my legs were bare, but for my white ankle socks. My mother didn't believe a fourth grader was old enough for knee socks, and I'd have to be 13 before I'd get my hands on a garter belt and stockings. <laughs> the fuzzy hair on my shins stood right up against the chill. It would be years before I was deemed an appropriate age for leg shaving. <laughs> Charles Kendall was patrol line leader, a job he took as seriously as Moses took the tablets. His orange safety belt was draped across last year's plaid wool coat. Sixth grade had made a man out of Charles Kendall, all right, and a bully of a man I might notice, I, I had noticed. My partner was Deborah Rice. We held hands and tried not to talk until we were around the corner at St. Bernard's Church. But with Charles barking out orders like a grown-up, Deborah couldn't keep quiet. Now I will, I just want to apologize if anyone is, and like there's a, a word here that, you know, I don't like to, <laughs> it's kind of a naughty word. <laughs> we're all grown-ups. I'm not impressed a bit. He's such a dick, she breathed into my ear, and I felt my face grow, un grow crimson from the word that I knew meant penis. Another word I couldn't actually say out loud. I wondered how Richard Dumphy could stand his name, especially when his mother yelled, Dickie, you get in here now, at the top of her lungs from the third floor porch of the dirty block. We walked up Hammond Street to Chestnut, and Deborah let her palm slap across St. Bernadette's iron fence. At the corner, Charles Kendon, Kel, Charge Kendall held his hand up like a traffic cop, but something caught his eye. Instead of bullying us back into formation, he squatted down over two bundles of the Evening Gazette, our late afternoon newspaper. Kids were falling out of line everywhere, and Charles Kendon wasn't, Kendall wasn't even yelling at them. Deborah yanked my hand hard, pulled me to where our patrol line leader had crouched. When we were close enough, I heard Barbara, I, uh, Barbara, I heard Deborah say, holy shit and she pushed me to look over Charles Kendall's shoulder. In all my nine years, I'd never seen headlines so big and black. They floated above two pictures, capital letters in the biggest ink. I didn't need to get any closer to see them. There were only two words, President Dead. Give me that belt, Kendall, if you aren't planning on crossing, then I'll do it, sixth grader Edward Klein shouted. Principal Gleason will kick your sorry ass if one of them kindergarten brats gets squished under a city bus. Charles slipped off the belt and handed it to Edward without a word. He looked like he'd been hypnotized. Deborah yanked me once more and we walked the rest of the way home without words. There was nothing to say about something so strange happening on an ordinary day. I'm home, Twig, I said, as I pushed open the kitchen door. I could smell potato pancakes frying in my mother's electric skillet. No meat, I remembered, not on Friday. I came around the corner to the pantry slowly. Twig looked up from the splattering grease with a squint. She'd been crying and still was. An L&M cigarette was attached to her bottom lip. Like magic, it stuck to her skin and moved when she spoke. The president's dead, we both said, followed by, owe me a Coke. Twig grated a large onion into the bowl of potato batter. I could see that she'd started these pancakes earlier because the grated potatoes were darkening from the air. And in a, in a short while, the bowl would be filled with black batter. The pancakes in the skillet sizzled, growing lacy brown edges. Twig flipped up one over, sending its pinkish gray belly down into the spitting oil. A horrible, horrible thing, my mother said between sniffles, but they got the guy. Till then, I had no notion the president was actually murdered. I couldn't read the small words over Charles Kendall's shoulder. People are so envious of beauty and youth, they just itch to destroy it, Twig boohooed. I followed her into the living room where she'd been ironing my father's shirts for work. The TV was humming the news of the assassination, grainy images of a hospital in Texas. Walter Cronkite looked very tired, the kind of tired sleep won't cure. Killed in cold blood before his wife and the whole world, Twig cried. Walter Cronkite took his glasses off and put them back on again. Where's the edge of night, I asked. Twig never missed an episode of her favorite soap opera. Personally, I preferred Love of Life. My Lord, Molly, our president is dead. Somehow the goings-on in Monticello seem insignificant, Twig lectured, and her cigarette was moving a mile a minute. I shrugged. Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy appeared on the television screen. What's all over her legs, Twig? I asked. That would be the blood and brains of her husband. Walter Cronkite looked beat down, and so did Twig. Our beloved president is dead. His beautiful children are fatherless, she wailed. Even so, I couldn't take my eyes off of Mrs. Kennedy's shins. Now, I can go on a little bit more with this chapter if you like. If I've caught your attention here. Okay. 
All right. The center of our universe was that black and white television where perfect families solved problems within the space of 30 minutes, not counting pitches for Winston Ch cigarettes and <clears throat> Nestle's Quick. Size 8 mothers wore dresses and nylon stockings and vacuumed all day every day. Wise and wonderful dads sat in armchairs spouting platitudes and dispensing solid advice. But every now and then I'd look around our apartment during the commercial breaks and wonder where we had gone so dreadfully wrong. You can pick your seat at the movies, my mother would say, but you can't pick your relatives. She was baptized Vernice, though I rarely heard her called by that name. She'd been twigged since her teasing, mean-spirited father nicknamed her. Battling fat was a lifelong occupation for Twig. Her children had not inherited her weight problems. She couldn't decide if she was pleased or disgusted by this twist. Genetics, she had lament, is nothing more than a goddamn roll of the dice. Now and then, she'd become unhinged over the futility of dieting and take steps to curb her desires. A year before, when I was recovering from a vicious case of poison ivy, she bought the safe. Bring it in here, doll, I heard her purr to the delivery man. He shoved a dolly over the threshold, stopping for a minute to adjust the straps, holding a large steel safe she'd purchased the day before. I'm just going to take the problem with reading is you go dry. If you just hold it one second. Okay, there we go. Twig ordered the man to place the big box in the far corner of the living room. After signing the papers attached to his clipboard, Twig dismissed him with a wave. She handed him a sealed envelope. She handed me a sealed envelope. Molly, she said, this is the combination to the safe. Why are you giving it to me, Twig? I asked, scratching behind my knee where watery blisters were forming. Just open it, she urged. I obliged, though I wasn't at all sure why. When the door swung open, Twig headed into the kitchen, and after a few minutes, she returned with full arms. I watched as Twig carefully stacked a box of Oreos, two cartons of ring dings, a sleeve of Girl Scout Thin Mints, and one half dozen of O. Henry bars inside the safe. She took one last look at the stash before closing the door. Twig spun the dial with great fanfare as if she were launching an ocean liner. Done, she declared. What's this all about, Vernice? I asked. Don't call me that, she warned. The safe, she explained, would be her salvation. Molly, I won't wear men's shorts to the beach again this year. I just won't, she said, patting the safe like a golden retriever. If it had a chin, she would have scratched it under it. If all the goodies in the house were locked inside, Twig reasoned, she'd have no choice but to eat healthy, sna healthy snacks. Like apples, oranges, stuff like that, she told me. She glanced around the apartment. Do we have any of that around here? I didn't know. I was too busy fretting over the idea of keeping those Girl Scout Thin Mints out of reach. What about Arlene and me, Twig? Can't we ever eat another sweet thing? I worried. You have the combination, Molly. Just don't open it for me, no matter how much I beg. Hear me? This seemed absurd, but I knew Twig was serious. She'd tried on a bathing suit earlier in the week. I heard her howling way out back by the cyclone fence, where I was tugging on vines that I would soon discover with poison ivy. I'd seen the tank suit fly out the kitchen window like some flag of surrender floating to the ground below. Now a year later, the murder of our president had proved too much for Twig. This calamity sent her to the safe. She saw Kennedy as part of our extended family, one of her own. November 22nd would be our big black X on our calendar that hung in our kitchen for the rest of Twig's life. Now open the safe, she said to me. No way, I answered. Come on, open the safe, she repeated. You said never, not even if you begged, I told her. Please, I'll make fudge if you do. No way, Vernice, nuh uh. Don't call me that, she warned. Now, Twig was never what the doctors call obese. She was muscular and wide, a big woman with a grand pile of chestnut brown hair that teetered precariously like a listing ship. She was stronger than she was heavy, like a wrestler, but no amount of telling her such a thing would make a dent in her self-image. When you mean fat, say it, she said. There's no sense dressing it up for a party it's not likely to attend. It didn't help that my father was of slight build. Nearly five inches shorter and 30 pounds lighter, Frank was bird-like with slim hips and narrow wrists that Twig could have snapped like pussy willow branches. The man has no ass to speak of, she had marveled. <laughs> Frank sold soda for Canada Dry, which didn't help Twig keep the weight off. She suckled a bottle of grape tonic, as we called it up here in New England, from morning till night. 
The empty glass bottles were stored in their wooden cases, stacked higher than Twig's hairdo in the barn and out back. These bottles would have netted me a nickel apiece if Frank didn't return them for redemption himself. What he didn't know was that that little, what we didn't know was that that little bird-like Frank saved every nickel that came from the bottles empty by Twig. By fall of that same year, Frank had enough spare change to take a trip to see the Alamo. He left on a raw November day in 1963, only two days before Lee Harvey Oswald shot President John F. Kennedy dead in the very same state of Texas, sending Twig to the safe, sobbing nearly nonstop for close to a week. We checked the mail regularly, but received only one measly postcard from Frank, telling us how we shouldn't judge all of Texas, Texas by the behavior of one wingnut. He said it was fine country, wide open and warm, with a horizon unlike any we'd ever seen back here in the city of Seven Hills. And that postcard was the last we heard from Frank. And suddenly, I had a lot more in common with that prissy Caroline Kennedy than just the state of Massachusetts. Wow. So that is our first chapter. So. Anyway, um, any questions? Anybody want to ask me anything about these characters? Like the fact that they're not based on anyone. <laughs> that's not my mother. Any knew my mother, that's not my mother. My, my mother was a, uh, my mother was sharp-tongued, but she was, she was not like Twig. Um, in the book, I, I do believe that everyone writes about something they know. I mean, there's no such thing as pure fiction. Like, if there is, maybe science fiction, but I know for myself, how can you not write about what you, you know and who you know? And if people, yeah, people who've been in your life, you somehow form them into something. I mean, the only true character in this book who is who she really was was the grandmother, Nana, because she was a character unto herself. And there was no way that I could leave her out. And there's no way that I could change her because she was, she talked like this. You remember? She was like, she talked like this. She smoked. She filled the cigarettes for about 40 years. She was a waitress at Worcester. She was a waitress at um, Messier's Diner. And when she was, um, and when, when she was really young, she um, actually had waitress mafia meetings um, when the guys would come up from Providence, Rhode Island. And she would, uh, they trusted her, which could explain why my grandmother, who worked as a waitress, eventually owned a 10-room house, which I don't know. <laughs> she saw a thing or two. <laughs> but uh, I, I had to put her in there just the way she was. She was not your regular fuzzy nana, but she was definitely a character worth writing about. So um, anyway, so that is the beginning of Searching for Atticus, which is titled this way because one of the books that Molly finds, because she finds solace in books, which I will say does come from me, she um, reads To Kill a Mockingbird and is so entranced by Atticus, and I think a lot of people are, because he is, in my opinion, the only perfect father figure in American literature. And um, she basically is looking, because Frank now we know took a powder, as they say. Frank took a powder. Um, so she is looking for something to replace that. But fear not, I have more things to read to you. Ta-da! This is a collection of um, columns that I had written in the first 15 years that I was writing for the paper. And uh, when I look back on it now, one of the things I notice is I didn't know how to trim the fat back then, which is what I call editing, because we are in love with our words, aren't we? My columns are 650 words. I know when I'm there. I know exactly when I'm there after all these years. Some of these suckers were like 1,100. I'm like, where were the editors? Who let me get away with this? So some of these, I would not read you those long-winded ones. But um, that's what I was just going to tell you a little bit about. I think I did tell you that kind of about the, oh, I know what it was. So the first column that I wrote, and the reason I was able to write columns, was because Paul De La Valle, who was the columnist for the paper, he had a spitfire with a hot temper. And one day he got in an argument with the publisher and said, F you, and left. And Walter Crockett called me, and he said to me, um, <clears throat> You wouldn't happen to have a column on you, would you? Like anything written, it would be a column. What do you think? He was pretty, like, terrified. And I, 
So what I said was, I just so happened that I'd been squirreling away columns I felt the need to write, even if they had nowhere to go. So I had written one called Booger and the Light Boys. And I did not know at the time that not only would they love this column, which was my first one ever, but it earned me my first award from the New England Press Association, um, which felt like the Pulitzer at the time, by the way, <laughs> although it was not. But um, I was thinking I would read Booger and the Light Boys to you because it was quite a, it's quite an, let me see what page he's on. Okay, 38, one second. So this was column numero uno from September of 1996. I didn't know Booger Long. I met him after the cancer took hold and moved in to stay, despite all treatment. He wore a baseball hat to cover the stark baldness chemotherapy left him. At his wake, I realized I'd never seen Paul Johnson the way he'd like to be remembered. Eight years ago, when Booga was 31 years old and feeling quite immortal, he drew the wild card. A bone marrow transplant from his sister would be his only hope when leukemia sees the young father, the young husband and father. The procedure was a success, and Booger would live to raise a little hell. He wasn't Wally Cleaver. He was a hard-drinking, mouthy scrapper. He was noisy and bold and inclined to pop off with a smart remark. Booger was married to an equally scrappy little brunette named Liz, and their life together was a love story told at the top of their lungs. <laughs> for 20 years, Booger worked for the Shrewsbury Light Company, uh, Light Department, actually, <clears throat> a town job for a town kid. He made a lot of friends there and more than a few enemies with his wise mouth. But the Light Boys are a tight crew and they take care of their own. That's why it was no surprise that Booga turned to his co-workers when the cancer came home again. Seven years after Booga beat the odds, the only opponent he couldn't flatten demanded a rematch. Booger and cancer went the distance and his corner of the ring was crowded. The Light Boys grew up in each other's kitchens, played ball in each other's backyards. Their lives have been meshed since boyhood. Sometimes it seems as if they have one long collective memory. Weddings, divorces, births, deaths, the Light Boys share all, all of life's, life's highs and lows. Some went off to Vietnam together. They don't talk about it much. The Light Boys have a tolerance for each other's quirks, like real brothers in real families. That's why Booger got away with being a burr in everybody's shorts so often. He was the bratty wise-ass they had to love. They loved Booger because his heart was as big as his mouth. He'd yell at one of them on a Monday and he'd help reshingle their roof on Tuesday. If anyone needed a ditch dug, a house painted, or a mountain moved, Booger was the man. He was a shirt off his back friend, the kind who would give you all that he had and a little bit more. When Booger beat cancer the first time, he set out to secure some life insurance for himself. He hadn't given it much thought before his brush with mortality, but now it seemed like a very good idea. With kids to think about, the bad boy didn't want the future to go unplanned. But insurance companies see these things differently. A cancer survivor is a bad risk. Ten years have to pass without relapse before a survivor is considered insurable. Booger almost made it. The light boys tried to remain upbeat as Booger's chances at tricking the demon twice grew slim. He kept a tight grasp on his friendships, making gallant efforts to attend weddings and parties. With a second bon bone marrow treatment from his sister, failed to stem the disease, hope dimmed. His bushy mustache fell away, pounds melted from his big bones as the cancer spread itself wide. Infections would be his undoing, but not before the light boys rallied one more time. They cooked for days, meatballs and pasta, peppers and sausage. They distributed raffle books that sold like hot lottery tickets. On a sweltering Friday evening, when the air conditioning at the Italian American Victory Club quit, the light boys handed Liz a check for $15,000. Maybe it wasn't megabucks, but it sure felt like it. And one morning, a Monday, September 9th, two days after the light boys delivered, Booga died. At Dana Faba, Booga bugged the nursing staff until the end. He lived long enough to watch the video of the only bash the original potty animal couldn't crash. He was 39 years old. When Anthony Spag Borghetti died, a thousand mourners filled Britain Funeral Home where the legendary retailer lay for viewing. Spag was Shrewsbury's best known citizen until Booger Johnson. The funeral home director estimates that 2,000 friends family and co-workers endured a 90-minute wait to say goodbye to a lovable regular guy. In Apollo, just outside the viewing room, the light boys gathered. They huddled, rubbed each other's shoulders, and hugged. They, some sat in chairs with their heads in their hands. 
One mourner remarked that Booger bothered him for so long that he finally gave up and liked him. Another was heard reminiscing about an anniversary party highlighted by the kind of chaos only Booger could create, complete with busted doors and flying fists. When voices rose as tales were swapped, someone mentioned that the loudest voice in this place would have been Booger's. He was a fanatic about his home, so much so that his last words to his dad were yard care instructions. He asked that his father tend to a board in the picnic table and some house painting that required a second coat. His friends often teased the teaser, flinging sticks onto his property to annoy the neat freak. At Booger's funeral, his brother passed by his casket and in a poignant gesture, tossed a handful of twigs collected from Booger's driveway. Booger left a wife, three children, and a legion of loyal friends, men and women who loved his mischief and his vibrancy. The light boys will tell Booger stories to their grandchildren, funny and warm remembrances about an average Joe with a big wild heart. And they will smile as they recall a restless spirit that even in death could not be bridled. So that was my first column. And that's what made me want to keep writing. So Stories like that, actually, about people, just regular people make the best columns. I've written a lot of stuff. I've written political stuff that got me in hot water and everything else. But truly the best ones that I've written, that I, in my opinion, my best writing plus the ones that I got the most out of personally were the ones where my opinion did not matter. It was not an opinion column at that point. It was covering someone else's life and bringing it all out for them, you know. I had. Um, children over the years that I would write about, you know, I could never use names or anything, but kids that, they never left me. They're, they're everything about them never left me. Um, if they had hard lives or if they were just lovely. I remember having a, a boy with Down syndrome who just drove us nuts. I loved him. He was just, but oh my goodness, he was naughty. And then he had one final seizure that took his life. and. Um, we went to the family, we went with the family to the services and things and just, those are the things that when you first become a teacher, <sighs> you have to really teach yourself that you can't take this home with you. When I first started and I was working with preschoolers, special needs preschoolers, I wanted to take everybody home and, I, and the teacher I worked with had been doing it for years and she said to me, toughen up or you or quit. She said, you're no good to anybody if you're a basket case every time a kid comes in here. It's a sad story because they've got so many of them. But all of those things, even being a single mother, being a student, being all of those things are what you pull into your writing, I think. And I can honestly say I like who I am at the age of 66 as a person more than I did if you took out any of these parts. I think that we truly are... You know, we're lucky enough to have our health and get to a certain age. How lucky we are, really are to understand ourselves a little bit more. And that's why I say, too, if I can get published at 66, if anybody here is a closet writer, go for it. You know what? Even if it's just your own memoirs. I've taught memoir writing to adults. Um, it seems to be something that's important to a lot of people. They want to be able to put down in words for their children to see, for their grandchildren to see, and I highly recommend it, even if it's just in journal form, because they're going to have questions when you're gone, and you're not going to be there to answer them. And that's another reason that I really encourage people to write, and especially like in, in my case, my mother died when I was in my early 30s, and ne there isn't a day that passes now that I don't say, you know, why isn't she here? I want to ask her that. When I was writing this, even, because she could have helped me you know, it's Worcester, and it was her Worcester, and it was Worcester t a time that, you know, I was a kid, but she was a, a, an adult that could have really helped me maybe with the color of it a little bit more. I don't know. My dad was a Worcester cop, and uh, he was colorful. Um, I don't know. Um, did you have a time thing? I don't want to drive anyone crazy here. Well, it's scheduled until 3 o'clock, but... Oh, you got ten more minutes of my, my melodious tones. If anybody has any questions, I'm sure Dennis would be Did happy. anybody want to ask me anything at all? Jim, when you do like an, an article for the Worcester Magazine, yes. you have this thought in you. Is it something that's been there for a while, like you said? Or how long does it take you to put that That's a great paper? question. You know, I, I'll tell you what. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, and lots of times no. Sometimes I, I write on Sunday mornings for the next issue. I'm in every other week, 
and I, I always, Sunday morning's my thing, but I have had many a Sunday morning when I get the cup of coffee and I go, oh, what are you gonna do? And a lot of the times I will thumb through newspapers looking for something that will spark me. Um, sometimes it's something a person said, just a remark they made that will set something off, but I find, I'm not a, I'm not a person who does notes with outlines and things like that. I find that I write as I write, as I go. If I have it in front of me, I can start it off. If I have an idea or I have a spark, I can take it. And, I, and it goes places I didn't even know it would. And I think that's what happened with the book, too. Um, but I have to make myself sit down and do it. I, I, I think that's why I wouldn't bother to make an outline, because I'm not going to make one. I'd go like this, I don't know, you know. And it'd be a grocery list when I was done. But when I sit down to do it, that's when it comes to me. Um, and m I've had a lot of people say to me, oh, I got a column for you, you know, whatever. And that's not necessarily true. That's something that happens to me in social situations. People come up and go, boy, if I got a column for you, you got to come down where I work. You wouldn't believe it. And I go, oh, yeah, I would. You know, but that happens a lot. But um, by and large, people have been wonderfully receptive about the book and just the writing in general. That's one of the things I've loved about it is in Worcester. Worcester, I, and I describe Worcester in, in the book as a, a city that measures, it measures like a city, but it thinks like a town. Worcester has more of a, a town mentality. It's little neighborhoods that, you know, fiercely protective of their neighborhoods too. Well, the biggest problem with Worcester is it sort of gets in its own, in its own way. It trips over its own feet all the time. Every time it's trying to do, be, do better, it does something goofy. And it's not so, you know, this kind of trips over its, itself. But right now it seems to be on the upswing with Polar Park and all that. But they've taken away a lot of the things that are in this book too, they've just disappeared, you know. A lot of that, especially the Kelly Square area, you know, all down there, that people are afraid to go to. And so if you haven't been down there, I understand. The driving is so much fun. But um, yeah, they've, they've, I guess they've, uh, Last time I was down there, I saw the new Kelly Square, which is shaped like a peanut, and it's just as annoying and difficult to maneuver as it ever was. So, I have so many, but I've always loved John Irving, and he has a new book out now that I have not gotten my hands on yet. I love John Irving. I love, um, let me see, I was a big um, Alice Hoffman fan um, for a while there. I, I've read all, I, I still go back and read stuff that I read before because now that I'm older I, I read it in a totally different way. Like I was saying, Tennessee Williams in the eighth grade, what did I know? You know, I go back and read it now, I go, oh, right, now I, now I know why they didn't want me reading that. You know, <laughs> it's like, oh, wow. And then you go like this, wait, I saw the movie. There was nobody gay in that movie. Well, there is in the play, you know. So it's it's always nice to take another yeah, take another look at things. Um, I would say yeah, I really do love John Irving. Uh, right now at home, I have a pile of books because I had a cataract that made it so I couldn't read for a while. So I've got a pile that I'm catching up on, but I'm halfway through a book that I'm sure you all are familiar with the title, if only to have seen the film, and that is Mildred Pierce the Joan Crawford movie, which was written by James Cain, who uh, he was a naughty writer in his day. How they ever got his stuff made into, well, they chopped it up, they cleaned it up with a big giant eraser, because his stuff, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm reading, I'm about halfway through Mildred Pierce and I'm going, whoa, Joan Crawford never did that. You know, it's definitely, his stuff was great. It was raw for the time. You know, I mean, I can see why there were people saying, oh, you know, back in the 30s, this stuff was raw. And another one I'm reading, um, I just got it. I haven't even started it yet. It just came in the mail. Uh, Tom Hanks just wrote a book that really looks interesting to me. I, I had never read any of his stuff, but I understand that he's written something that is about the movie industry. It just looked kind of cool. I heard a couple of um, interviews with him that really looked kind of... Uh, like something, yeah. Do you um, like biographies? Biographies, let me see. You know what, I... Oh, biographies and memoirs. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've read um, a few, because I'm an old movie buff, so one of the best ones I've ever read was Natalie Wood. She was a cracker. Uh, uh, Catherine Hepburn. Um, I have um, Obama, um, a few others I'm trying to think right now. You know, I'll get in the car and ride home and go, why didn't I say this? Why didn't I say that? I know. Yeah. I mean, um, John Irving, definitely. That's somebody who's quirky, but I loved his stuff. I, I just always found it fascinating that he could, he came up with some quirky characters, you know. 
Um, that's the fun part, you know. And, and I start to wonder, oh my goodness, I hope he doesn't know people like that. A lot of the stuff that I wrote when I first was writing with, um, was humor. Um, I do humor quite a bit, actually. And um, there was a, my kids, well, I'll tell you right off this bat. I raised my kids as a single parent for a long time. I've been divorced from their dad for nearly 20 years. Well, now it's 30. And sometimes the frustrations of juggling work, household chores, kids, pets, and poverty really got to me. In the following 1996 piece, I was able to exact revenge on two people I love the most in the world, my kids. I, <clears throat> it felt good, well, let me tell you, and I had fun writing about it. I felt like Raymond Chandler, and that's another author that I've always liked, only poorer and less famous. I see now that this is really two columns, and I wrote it to, if I wrote it today, I'd squeeze two paychecks out of them for it, but, um, and actually, I'll just cut it in half when I read it, but um, I, I did it in a voice, I, I totally did it like a, um, so it would sound like a hard-boiled novel you know, like a Maltese Falcon type thing. And it's called Miss Williams, We Hardly Knew Ye. I didn't do it, I swear. I was nowhere near the scene of the crime. I was out of town when Miss Williams bought the farm. I'm innocent, I tell you. She wasn't singing when I turned on the pantry light, but I didn't think much of that. She'd never been what you'd call a songbird, never showy or loud, just a finch. Something made me peer into her cage and what I saw wasn't pretty. Miss Williams was dead. Beaked down on the floor of her cage, her little brown body no bigger than a cigarette lighter. Deceased, depart, morte. Her water dish was full and her seed cup was brimming. I knew she hadn't died from neglect because I'm the zookeeper. Maybe the draft from the window did her in. When the heat in the fl when you heat with a, uh, when you heat a flat with stoves, outer rooms get icy. Feathers aren't enough, just ask Charo. I took the cage down from its hanger and slipped it inside the Worcester trash bag. Before I nodded the twist tie, I mumbled, adios. And that's when I realized that without me, Miss Williams would have been stiff on her perch a long time ago. No one else fed her, filled her water, or cleaned her humble abode. Of course, we just had to have her when we saw her. Please, 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 can we, huh? Promises of tender, loving care that would never involve me followed the begging. We brought the tiny finch home and my, named her after my, after my boy's favorite teacher, a petite young thing with hair the same color as the bird's plumage. During the ride home, the boy decided that someday Miss Williams would need a mate. We'd raise the Williams finch family, Ted, Vanessa, Cindy, Andy, and Hank. I suggested that we buy a male finch and name it Atticus, but he ignored my cute literary reference. You might say it flew right over his head. <laughs> within a week, I have how dare I, within a week of Miss Williams' arrival, her drinking dish was dry as the cuddle bone, her seed cup was as empty as the piggy bank that funded her purchase. Keeping the finch alive became my job. If I waited for the kids to remember, Miss Williams would have taken her final flight long before I made my grisly discovery. My behavior followed her demise, following her demise is suspect, I'm told, but I had a point to make. I put Miss Williams on the porch with the trash. I told no one. I wanted to see how long it would take for someone to notice that Miss Williams was missing. Now, before I'm called cold for my actions, let me make my position clear. I have no affection for house pets. Mind you, I've, I have a cat still to this day, all right? Now, let me move on to the, this is where I kind of got, this is why I say they owed me two, two checks. I'm gonna just move a little forward in this story for you. All right. I figured a day or two might pass before one of the kids noticed the pantry floor didn't crunch under the, under the, well, until, the, until the kids noticed that the pantry floor didn't crunch under their feet from the seed halls, Miss Williams liked to fling through the bars. After four days, nobody realized that the cabinet door didn't bump into their cage when it was opened. Both kids continued to climb up on the counter to reach the secret hiding spot for snacks without noting the empty space where the cage once dangled. A week passed. I didn't miss whacking my head on my cage every morning when I made my coffee. I didn't long for the chance to sweep up the spilled seeds that littered the floor and stuck to my slippers. I didn't miss Miss Williams, and apparently no one else did either. Two weeks went by before one of the neighborhood kids, a regular, asked, hey, where's your bird? I had to fess up. Great moaning and wailing ensued. They asked about our funeral service. The looks of horror were Halloween-worthy when I said, you guys took her out with the trash. Cruel? 
Nah, I like to think of it as a life lesson, a learning experience. Childhood is full of them. It's my job to make sure that each one holds a lasting message, and it's a big bonus if I can be amused during the process. And the next time they beg me for a new pet, I'm going to toss them the bird. <laughs> so that's the kind of thing I used to write a lot of, too. I do occasionally do some humorous stuff now. But anyway, I want to thank you all for listening to me rattle on. I hope I didn't speak too quickly, which I tend to do. And I blame that on being a teacher because I used to have to get the lessons in really quick before they got bored and weren't listening anymore. <laughs> and none of you appeared to be doing that, so I appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, I, I will head on, I'll mosey on over there. If anybody's interested, I can sign it for you. Don't feel obligated. It's also available on Amazon. And so the Jacob Edwards Library has a copy as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And here I go.